All right, it is the top of the hour, so we're going to get started. Um, just kind of a logistical thing. If you have any technical issues at any point, um, if you're attending or presenter, just private message me in the chat and I'm happy to troubleshoot with you um, in case that happens. Um, but barring any technical issues, the title of this webinar is um, Documenting Community Mo Movements on the Fly, a Case Study of Greensboro's BLM Demonstrations. The presenters today are Stacy Krim, who is the Curator of Manuscripts at UNC Greensboro, and David Gwynn, who is the Digital Projects Manager at UNC Greensboro. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to them. Okay, let me share here. And did that work? It did. Okay, good, because I'm not seeing anything other than people's faces right at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Okay. Um, hold, please. All right. Uh, so uh, today we're here to do a presentation called Documenting Community Movements on the Fly, uh, a case study of Greensboro's Black Lives Matter demonstrations, which repeats what you just heard, but yeah, I felt like I should start since that's what's on the screen anyway. So who are we? Um, Stacy, who are you? I am Stacy Krim. I'm the curator of manuscripts here in the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives. Okay. And I am David Gwynn. I'm the digitization coordinator in the Electronic Resources and Information Technology Department, also in the University Libraries at UNC Greensboro. So um, our agenda today is going to be a quick introduction, um, a look at the current context of social justice and race in Greensboro, a little bit about why we started the project, uh, some obstacles we faced and some issues with implementation, some methods of acquisition, some logistics and processing, and you know, basically the nuts and bolts of how we did things, how it was promoted at the end, and then we're going to actually tour the digital collection at the end. So I'm going to pass it back over to uh, Stacy to start. All right. So the first thing uh, when you're thinking of a community collection is to know your community. Um, and right now, uh, especially with this sort of collection, this is very much a reactionary collection that it, or reactionary documentation project that is based on the effects uh, and influence of events that are happening at the national level. So you need to understand how um, the, the national level is going to affect the microcosm, um, and in this case, Greensboro. So to give you a bit of background when we're dealing with um, the Black Lives Matter movement or the representation of um, civil rights in, in the Greensboro area, of course, we have a, a rich history that includes the Greensboro sit-ins. But most recently, um, to know the climate um, is important. So in 2015, it was found that Black drivers were significantly discriminated against by law enforcement. You were much more likely to be pulled over. You were much much more likely to have your vehicle search and much more likely to have force used against you. So this is the climate and what life is like in our city for at least 41% of the population of our city. Go ahead to the next slide, David. And added to that, we have incidences in Greensboro that are similar to the events we're seeing protested on the national level. So we do have a case where a young man by the name of Dewan Yours, who was standing on his mother's porch, was arrested by the police while he was sitting and waiting for his mother to come home and let him in. And brutality to a was used against him to a degree that was clearly unwarranted. None of the officers were actually charged, although the primary officer did resign from his position. And currently, we're seeing demonstrations in our city about Marcus Dion Smith, who was hogtied by eight officers as he was walking away from the North Carolina Folk Festival in 2019. Both of these cases have body cam footage, so they're well documented. Unlike the Floyd case, we do not have people on the sidelines um, with cell phones documenting the incident. 
Um, and that's really one of the, the main differences is uh, the incidences in our city haven't necessarily translated to the national community because you don't have the, the public documenting these events. These were all happening um, in places that people could not easily walk by to witness. The, Dion Smith, the Marcus Dion Smith case is still being protested and lawsuit is still an is underway against the Greensboro City Council. Um, but uh, without question, this case is very reminiscent of, of the George Floyd case uh, and happening in 2019. That meant when the Floyd case hit national news, this was felt very, very deeply in our community. So when we uh, were looking at documenting things, we knew that our community would have some sort of response. We weren't exactly certain what that response would be, but we knew we had to be prepared uh, and follow current events to see how things turned out. Go ahead to the next slide. So here's a rough timeline of events as they, they were happening. Um, the, uh, it took around uh, four days, four or five days for the George Floyd case to really hit the Greensboro area. Um, and it really hit on May 30th and 31st. Uh, and that was a weekend, that was a Saturday and Sunday. Contrary to what I was anticipating, the protests in our city were not really violent. Um, actually, they were beautiful in their own way. What happened was the, um, this, the businesses in downtown Greensboro, especially along Elm Street, if you're familiar with that, put up plywood to protect their windows and doors, to protect their businesses. And during the day, artists from all over Greensboro came and began creating murals on this plywood with messages of unity and social justice. During the night, uh, we did have protest happening in the city. Um, the city was actually under quarantine after 8 p.m. Uh, we didn't really have any violence. There was one incident where someone threw a brick through the window of the International Civil Rights Museum, but the police were able to apprehend that individual, and it uh, was found out that this person was from out of town and trying to start trouble. So the response we were seeing in Greensboro was actually a uh, very peaceful protest compared to undoubtedly what the citizens in the city were experience, experiencing, how they could relate to what was happening with George Floyd. It took us roughly uh, 15 days from um, the murder of George Floyd to begin our process, our project. That was when we understood um, what we would be doing, what types of material we would be dealing with, and how we would begin going about the process of documenting these protests. So um, to give you a little bit of background of why we wanted to start this project, um, and the first thing I can say is our university and our library is very much invested in community engagement and EDI initiatives. Um, the, the photograph with the quote is our chancellor, Chancellor Franklin Gilliam, who uh, has really been just a terrific chancellor leading us in times of such uncertainty. And he has uh, made certain that at the highest administrative level, we have blessings to document, to learn more, to understand, to receive training about EDI initiatives and to engage the community. So this is part of our university's mission on a whole. Um, also, our my one of my curatorial areas in our manuscripts collection is local and regional history. So if, if history is happening, it, and it's happening locally, then it is literally my job to uh, document it. Um, if I'm not doing that, then I'm not doing my job. It's um, my job to follow up and put it online. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, of course, a lot of times in archives, you're seeing representations of what could be considered the elite. So it's the important people, quote unquote, who end up being represented in archives. Um, we 
have a very strong background in collecting for communities um, in addition to individuals. So we aren't necessarily looking for the elitist collection. We are looking for representative collections um, and how we can contribute to the documentation of that. So uh, we are specifically, given our history and the climate in Greensboro, looking at um, how institutional discrimination is happening against marginalized groups. We believe this should be documented. It should be part of the historic record. Um, this is fully, this, pro, this prog project in this capacity is fully supported. I've never had any pushback um, that we may be documenting things that aren't pretty. Um, a lot of history isn't pretty, but this is what we, we try to focus on as well. And we do have, feel very clearly, both David and I and our respective responsibilities that it's the job of modern librarians and archivists to assist communities in telling their own histories, not for us to own the history histories and then display it as though we are the experts. So within the course of this presentation, hopefully we will be able to give you a good model demonstrating how you can do this with your own communities. So we have several issues and complications uh, in the course of this project, the big one being COVID-19. Uh, beginning halfway through March of 2020, uh, we were told if unless you were essential worker to work from home. So um, that uh, we were all learning Zoom. <laughs> Remember way back then when no one knew how to know what Zoom was. Um, we were all figuring out how to meet. Um, we also were not allowed to travel off site and meeting for meetings. So we weren't able to meet amongst ourselves as a team. And in addition to David and myself, there were three other members of our team, including um, a, a faculty member, Dr. Tara Green, who is a professor in the uh, Department of African American Studies and Women, Women and Gender Studies. So we had to conduct meetings for over Zoom. We also were limited in being able to do community outreach to be able to beat the streets and start talking to people um, because all of these events were happening on the streets. That was a very difficult thing for us. So communicating with potential, potential community collaborators, potential donors, all of this was complicated by not being able to meet in person. We also knew we wanted to have an oral history component to this project and our oral history standards are always in person. So David and I for the projects we're involved with will usually show up with a camera and microphone and set up with the person. We had to move all of our oral histories to Zoom which was not the best quality but it was important to do that on the fly. Uh, so we, we had to come up with uh, best practices essentially for our department for conducting those oral histories in Zoom. We also had curfews. Um, of course, the city, uh, the state had curfews and the, our city had curfews as well, especially after the protest started. Um, so we were not really able to be out past um, 8 p.m. <laughs> basically without it being uh, an issue potentially that the, the police could pick us up because we were violating curfew. Um, and of course, most of the protests were happening after 8 p.m. So that was a problem for us. Um, and we also had an issue of how are we going to do with deal with physical material um, that may be contaminated with COVID. Um, how are we going to deal with the risk of transmission? So we had to put protocols in place um, throughout our department for uh, dealing with donors and, and that issue. Go ahead. And of course, um, foremost on our mind was the protection of individuals involved in the protests because it became highly publicized that law enforcement was using CCTV, um, people's social media posts and the photographs of journalists to hunt down protesters uh, and potentially arrest them. And also protesters were at risk of being fired from their place of employment if they were discovered. Um, this is a very frank conversation we had to have very early on in our project because we're state employees. So essentially, if, if a law enforcement agency found out we were documenting this project, they could just say, give us everything because everything is, is public uh, record for us. 
So um, we did not have to deal with, thankfully, any sort of criminal behavior becoming evident in our photos or videos, in part because uh, like the, the brick through the window incident that happened, uh, happened at a time we would not have been allowed on the streets. Um, but we did have to have measures in place to face wipe and protect um, any, any uh, demonstrators. Most of the photographs, um, as you will see later, were of the demonstrations of the protests themselves were self-submitted by the demonstrators. So um, it was not us necessarily taking those photographs and we felt a certain degree of safety in people self-selecting what they were deciding to submit to us. So we also had to discuss, um, are we going, how are we going to acquire material or are we not going to try to go after donations, but is there a way to uh, let people contribute to the project without actually having to get them to sign papers over for the material? And this brought up several questions. Um, certainly for the, the situation with born digital records, um, I think it is very safe to say that is the new normal for the documentation of modern archival, um, of modern historical projects. Everyone's carrying around their phone. Everyone has the capacity to pull it out and take photographs or to take video. So we felt confident um, that this project would be a highly digital project where physical material was only going to be a minor contribution. Um, we also wanted to talk about uh, post-custodial archives, which summary is, do we have to own everything? Um, if our mission is to collect and preserve, do we really have to have someone sign the uh, rights and copyright over to us for us to do our job of collecting and preserving? And this is closely tied to the concept of archival colonialism. Um, so especially when we're, we're trying to preserve documentation of underrepresented communities who have frequently faced discrimination at the institutional level, what right do I have to go to these communities as a state employee representing, um, representing the institution and ask them to hand their material over to me? And I say this as a person who 50% of my job is actually donor relations and collection development. Um, we really have the, in traditionally in archives, have had this mindset of uh, getting, going out and getting co collections to build our own collection and our own fame. But maybe we should be thinking more about community engagement as a way of preserving and making accessible material, historical materials, where we're focusing on building relationships with communities who may have a great reason to distrust the organizations we represent uh, because of discrimination and build those re relationships so that we can uh, repair what has been done in the past, but also give the community control of their historical narrative. Um, and I'll uh, stay on this slide for a second just to show you. If you look over on the right, it's part of our new digital collections platform, which I'm proud of, but I'm not going to talk about right now. But also to show that we do have uh, some functionality built into our collections for community contributed collections. It's something we've been working on for the past several years. It's a kind of a growing area for us where we'll actually go out and work with people, digitize their material and say, if you'll let us borrow it long enough to digitize it, we can share it with the world and then you can have it back. And it's a way of, you know, adding material to the collections that we might not otherwise be able to, to add. And, you know, when we're no longer focusing on the fact that we have to physically own those materials, like Stacy said. Okay, so another good way of acquiring material going into collections like this is to create it yourself, um, which is not a way that we usually think of this as librarians and archivists, but um, sort of the genesis of the Black Lives Matter project for us in a lot of ways was the fact that several of us were already documenting current events uh, around the campus and around the community. Now, several months back, actually probably pushing toward years back now, uh, we had documented a demonstration in Greensboro by the Westboro Baptist Church folks through uh, photos and video, as you can see on the left there. Um, in the middle, um, 
my laundry room, actually. Uh, several of us were actually documenting various aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic on campus, on the community. We were photographing campus and community uh, manifestations of what was happening with the pandemic. And when the protests began and the uh, art associated with the protests, we started documenting that as well, be, be it through drive throughs or walking around downtown, whatever. Uh, in my case, I figured that the art would probably be preserved by someone, and it actually mostly was by uh, various museums. Uh, but I and others among us felt it was really important to document the art in its original context downtown, actually attached to the buildings before it was removed and kind of shown in isolation at museums. Um, so I went downtown on a Saturday afternoon and basically I sort of walked the full length of Elm Street from one end to the other, photographing pretty much everything I could. Um, also did some shots in Winston-Salem and Raleigh, uh, Durham, Washington, DC. And at one point uh, on a related trip when it was felt at one of those brief moments last year when it actually felt safe to travel, some stuff in Kenosha as well. Um, and Stacy, uh, Dr. Tara Green, who Stacy mentioned earlier, uh, and others were kind of doing the same thing. There were a lot of people actually recording this in different ways. Uh, we assumed that community members were probably doing it as well, and were probably also documenting the protests themselves. And we wanted to come up with sort of a way to uh, to make that material available online too. So it sort of grew out of creating some of our own. Um, materials but uh assuming in the process that other people were doing the same thing and we probably needed to talk to them about it so one of the first things we did when we decided to proceed with the project is to come up with a mechanism where people could actually contribute materials to us um, we felt it was really important to make the submission process as frictionless as humanly possible uh, we wanted to make it easy um, mobile friendly um, which has been a problem with our digital collections in the past long story there um, so essentially what we went with was a google form um, everybody likes google forms and you can upload things um, you can require fields you can allow people to upload files with a google form and it'll just drop it into your google drive account which is great. Um, we also included options on the form for other types of material that people might want to contribute also. And I'll zoom in on that actually a little more in just a couple of minutes. Um, we did accept physical material. We assumed there would be physical material and we were willing to accept physical material. Uh, we included a box on the submission form that said, if you have stuff and you're interested in letting us, if you're interested in either donating the stuff or letting us digitize the stuff and give it back to you, you let us know. And yeah, we're definitely, we're definitely willing to go with that. Um, rule number one, we figured going into this process was not to worry about an awful lot of rules at the outset, which kind of, uh, in a lot of ways, I think goes against our training, or what we've been brought up to think has to happen with every article we accession into the library of the archives but um again we wanted to make this as frictionless as possible we wanted to make it easy we didn't want to set a lot of rules um and we assumed that essentially we could work out details and kinks later if we needed to the most important thing now was to be timely and to get material that we could share as quickly as possible and a big part of this too is that we didn't really want to presume to tell other people what their story should be. You know, who am I to tell an activist what should be important to them? Um, you know, that's not my place to do. And we want to let the people who are actually creating the story tell the story and not tell them how to do it or what's right or what's wrong. Now, obviously, there have to be some guidelines as far as things like copyright, et cetera. But generally, you know, as we assumed that we wanted people to tell their own story here that's that's kind of the point in this case um, and as such community outreach to organizations right so um 
as I mentioned earlier, uh, not being able to meet in person was a significant challenge for our community outreach. So we had to think about things a bit differently. So we began with our network of relationships we already have um, in the process of, of working very heavily with our community in, in many respects. Uh, several people on the team have their own networks. So we reached out to the people we knew who might be uh, invested in the protest and the Black Lives Matter project. Project. And to keep this organized, because we did have some overlap, we created a spreadsheet to know who was contacting what organization or what person in particular and what they, when they had contacted that organization. Um, and even though uh, with some, some of the relationships were fruitful from the beginning, um, some uh, may not, may not have yielded any material for the collection, but it's important for community members to know this is something our institution is doing and that we are actively engaged in. Um, we also followed what was happening in media. So we were reading the articles, um, and we were following the social media, and we were looking for individuals and organizations involved with the protest who were named in those articles, and then tracked them down to reach out to them, especially for oral, trying to get oral histories. So we were actively following news stories as they happened. And we also uh, have a network of archives and museums in our area that that we uh, are in friendly terms with. So we reached out to that network to see who, to see if anyone else was collecting in a similar way, um, in part to see if we could collaborate and in part to make certain we weren't stepping on each other's toes. The primary institution that was collecting similarly to us was the Greensboro History Museum, who actually ended up being the major repository for most of these, this mural art that was created in downtown Greensboro. Greensboro. They also ended up getting like the brick that was thrown through the international civil rights uh, window. So they were actively create collecting. And that was a relief because for a while it looked like we were the only ones. And as an archive, I am not set up to handle giant pieces of plywood art, even though we got three three pieces um, and one on a bed sheet. Um, there was no way as a repository we would have been able to preserve the creative output that happened. The Greensboro History Museum, we met with them. Um, they were doing interviews, uh, like lunchtime interviews with many of the same people we were trying to do oral history interviews with. So we shared information and we sent each other um, contacts if people were interested, if it, if it felt, more, felt more on the archival end, Greensboro history would send to them to us and we would send uh, many of the artists to them. And they put together a truly spectacular exhibit of those current events in a record time. I truly, I have no idea how they managed to get that exhibit up as quickly as they did. So it's good to know who is working on similar um, things to, to you as an organization. So you have the potential for that collaboration. Yeah, if you have not seen that exhibit at the Greensboro History Museum, I highly recommend it. It's just, it's absolutely amazing, particularly how quickly they were able to get it in place. It's just, it's just incredible. Uh, and I'll just elaborate on one thing Stacy said too. Uh, with uh, news media, it's also important to keep in touch with any press contacts you have because they might if not always to be able to contribute material, they might be able to point you in directions of people that you should talk to as well. So, um, so a few of the, another issue we ran into that was the issue of copyright and intellectual property. It's not something we like to dwell on, but it's a thing that we always have to think about. Uh, so as such, we include a copyright release just in the form that people, uh, send to us when they're donating materials and we also you know have to think about the issues of publishing representations of art where copyright may apply this has not been an issue in this case because the art was in public places so there weren't really any legal issues ethically we got around that by trying to attribute the art wherever we we possibly could which we'll get to a little more when we talk a little about the metadata aspect of it i love metadata um <laughs> A big issue, as Stacey mentioned before, though, were issues of privacy and confidentiality. We were worried because at the time there were a lot of cases where law enforcement, as Stacey mentioned, was using imagery, social media posts, news footage to identify people that were involved in protests. So we decided early on 
that one of the, the, the things that we would offer were allowing people to be as confidential and as anonymous as they wanted to, and also offering to do things like scrub GPS coordinates from photos that we got, et cetera. Um, fortunately did not become an issue for any of the materials that we got, but we were, we were fully prepared to do this if need be to, to pull any identifying information from the metadata from the photos. Uh, as you know, when you take a photo with a digital camera, particularly with a digital camera on a phone, it logs your GPS coordinates, it logs the exact precise place and time. This is all things that could potentially be used against people in the future. And we wanted to give people the option of not having that material included when we place the stuff online. So um, that was a way we were looking to protect participants here as much as possible. There were some logistical issues too. Uh, as any of you know, who've dealt with contributions of digital material from members of the community or even archival collections you might have picked up that have been born digital. Sometimes you run into some really weird formats that you don't recognize. Uh, people with their phones, uh, a lot of people are behind the curve as far as technology goes. And a lot of people may very well be ahead of the curve that we're at or that we're regularly working at um, as far as technology on their phones. Uh, new image and video formats on a regular basis on iPhones that may not easily be openable in Photoshop or whatever tools you're using on a regular basis are things you need to work out for. And you just need to be prepared for a variety of conditions, of formats, of quality levels from the imagery that you're gonna get. Um, you might see things like HEIF format, which I bet a lot of you have no earthly idea what an HEIF file is. It is a compression uh, format that Apple is using, that is allowing as an option on iPhones now for the cameras. Uh, and you can't just open those in Photoshop. You've got to have some way of converting them. So you need to be prepared for that. You may get PNG files that people saved as screen captures. Uh, your video files are going to be all over the map as well. From really old phones, you might see things that are like WAV for, or uh, AVI format, really old formats like that. Um, container formats like MOV, MP4, M4A. What you've got to understand is that you got to be ready for these and have a basic idea about how you might convert them and get them online. And usually there are ways that are not too onerous. And also to understand, and this is a hard thing to get your mind around sometimes too, is that nothing is ever going to be perfect. The stuff that you're collecting here is material that's created by activists and by community members not by professional photographers, not by archivists. Everything is not going to be perfect and 100% clear and bright and sharp. No, it's pretty easy to take good photos with the, with, with the average phone camera now. Everything's not gonna be perfect and you've gotta be comfortable with a level of things that are maybe not at the standard uh, resolution or quality that you might be used to. Um, that's just a fact. So curating digital collections um, is, is always an interesting thing for us. Uh, to start out with the Black Lives Matter collection in particular, we decided, is this should this be one digital collection or should it be a lot of different collections on an intellectual or archival le level that are all merged into one digital collection? We decided in this case that we would and most, in, for most of the collection have one digital collection, which we're calling the Triad Black Lives Matter protest collection. The reason we did that is because so many of the uh, items that we thought we would be getting might have been anonymous in origin. Um, we weren't necessarily going to have names attached to them, so it seemed better to put them in one collection. We did, however, when we were given permission to do so, always credit the creators of the materials, the donors, but it was pretty much put into one big archival collection here. A big issue, though, with digital photo collections, um, with all born digital photo collections, is just because it's digital and you have digital files for everything, do you still publish all of it? Or do you do some curation like you would with a print photographic collection? Because, um, you know, with digital photos, that's 
it's, there's exponential growth in the number of photos that are taken of any one image. And you kind of have to draw a line between publishing uh, 16 photos that are essentially the same, but from a slightly different angle each time. But weighing that against exercising editorial judgment, which again, we might not want or have the right to exercise that judgment, because uh, again, we're not the ones telling the story here and we're not the ones deciding what's important. So you've got to kind of weigh that. I mean, yeah, obviously if it's obvious there's no difference between the 16 photos, you might only only want to use a representative sample, but you want to be careful about not using too many of them or deciding to do drop too many photos. Uh, and very important, proper credit to the artist represented where possible, as you can see in the metadata here, if we can figure out who the artist is, you need to identify who that artist. Uh, a, ethically, it's important, but B, you know, frankly, you want to give these artists some publicity too, some <laughs> some Google love, if you will. So, um, for what that's worth. So, creating metadata, uh, there were there are a lot of considerations here. Uh, mainly, this is a very timely project, and we assumed that time was of the essence. We went with a pretty thin metadata profile for this. Uh, there's not a lot of de de uh, description of individual photos. There's a lot of repeated titles, a lot of repeated descriptions because we wanted to get it online fast, basically. Uh, we wanted to make it discoverable, obviously. So, you know, tagging and subject headings, et cetera. But we basically wanted to let the stuff tell the story rather than us telling the story. And uh, our assumption has always been on this project that it's timely, we need to get it going now. And we can add details and context later. Right now, yeah, I'll admit there's not a lot of context to this collection. Um, I see a few months down the road when we can look at it in a more contextual framework, adding essays and more description to the photos, saying what was going on, timelines, that kind of thing. But we're in the middle of it right now. And like uh, like journalists say, uh, you know, this is kind of the first draft of history, if you will. And, you know, it's primary source material. So there you go. Uh, as far as creating metadata, one of the processes we followed, though, was using what's there wherever possible. Um, again, on the phone photo, since a lot of these are recorded in the photo and embedded, then you can determine sort of dates and locations from the phone metadata. Now, again, this is tricky because we're also saying that we will anonymize that if needed. But if we haven't been told we need to anonymize it, we can say determine what exact time the photo was taken, what city it was taken in, etc., which is one of the things that makes born digital uh, collections in some ways a lot easier to deal with, which is actually kind of nice. But you also want to check that because, you know, if there's some issue with the clock on the phone or with the GPS being turned off, you may have inaccurate information too. So you want to make sure that whatever you've got seems kind of reasonable anyway. And then it comes time to get it online. I'm a big proponent of using what you've got. Uh, whatever platform that may be, if you have access to a Mecca and with reclaim.org, you can have access to a Mecca really cheaply if you were so inclined. Um, if you're using Content DM, WordPress, whatever, just use what you've got and get it online or partner with someone who's got a better platform for putting it online than you do. Uh, it's one of the things we like to do is we're happy to work with uh, institutions that may not have the the opportunity to put things online themselves and help get the stuff online. Um, a lot of that figures into our new digital collections platform, which we were unfortunately launching right as these protests in this collection building was taking place. Basically, we've spent the last year migrating out of a content DM installation into a platform using Islandora. The great thing about this is it allows us to work uh, to come up with kind of a new web presence for community partners that sort of focuses on the partner more than focusing on the UNCG part. But it also meant it was a little tricky getting these things uh, online at the time because we were having to add them both to our Content DM installation and to our Islandora installation since it would be going live sooner. So that was not a huge impact, but it sort of affected the way we thought about the collections as well. So. Uh, there you go. 
So uh, spreading the word that we were doing this. Um, of course, we did have um, some, some publication in UNCG Magazine and in the Society of American Archivists weekly newsletter. Um, and it was great to get uni university level publicity. But probably the most important for us was social media publicity. So this post that you're seeing a, a screenshot of, it was the first post um, our university posted on their main Facebook page. And um, I immediately started following the comments, looking for, th um, looking for people who might be worth contacting. And if you look at the bottom, the first, those two people you see liking are Valerie Kaleko and Alex Figueroa. Well, Valerie, Valerie is a graduate student here and she immediately recognized this artwork, which we didn't know who had done it. Um, it's part of our collection as being the work of Alex Figueroa. So when I was following the comments and um, Alex commented, oh, that's my, that's my piece. I immediately was able to message him and get in touch with him to ask more information about the piece to see if we had any other of his pieces in the collection we could identify and also to arrange an oral history with him. So never underestimate the power of social media. Um, also, we were able to spread through word of mouth. Um, and this was important uh, faculty in terms of faculty, we have faculty who are incorporating this project into their, their class curricula. Um, we had uh, Dr. Tara Green, who actually had her students contribute through oral histories, um, what they had experienced during the protest to be part of the collection and part of it. That was a class assignment. And we had a uh, art class um, by Nicole Scalese, Dr. Scalese, who had her students write essays or poetry talking about their experience and reaction to the art. Um, or the material, the additional protest material that's found within the collection. So we're excited that we had such immediate feedback from our faculty and incorporation into the classroom. And of course, I mentioned we did uh, notify our community partners, but what I found is I was speaking with donors during that period because this all was very much on everyone's mind. I had donors actually um, on completely unrelated topics and collections ask me what we were doing to um, document and represent the Black Lives Matter movement. And I was able to talk about this project in addition to other collections and projects we have going. Um, so it was interesting to me that donors actually were interested in, th in this as almost a condition of donating to show we had an institutional commitment. Okay, so let's take a really quick tour of the project for now. Um, again, I'm not going to belabor this point because you can look at it yourself and <laughs> see more, but we'll do a quick a quick run through. But the first thing I'm, I'm going to show you is not actually live. It's an oral history interview within the project. Uh, and uh, the reason I'm starting with this and showing it to you as a screenshot rather than live is because unfortunately the oral histories are not online right now due to some video and some other logistical issues. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I said, uh, use the options you have to get them online. The option that we have had traditionally for getting video of oral history online is YouTube. Uh, because we don't have a streaming server at UNC Greensboro. Hopefully we'll be working on that soon. But we're running into some problems now with YouTube because YouTube has instituted a new policy recently of monetizing everything, which means they're likely to put commercials in the middle of everything online, whether they're necessarily appropriate to the content or not. Uh, you know, we may have someone talking about we it didn't end up want to end up in the position of having someone talking about their recovery issues and in the middle of that have an absolute vodka ad show up on youtube that was kind of wrong we thought so we're in the process of moving our video to a new platform so actually a lot of our oral history is not online at the moment um but they're good uh and they'll be online again soon uh most of the oral history was done by uh by Dr. Tara Green and by, by Dr. Rhonda Jones here at UNC Greensboro. As Stacy said earlier, we use Zoom for most of the interviews, which does not provide high quality video and which caused some other problems as we were growing into using the platform. But we felt like the content and the immediacy were more important than having you know broadcast quality video at this point. Um, and if you've watched the news lately, 
Zoom kind of is broadcast quality video at this point anyway, but um, we, uh, for our oral history interviews, we use the Ohms Oral History Metadata Synchronizer, which is a really neat project out of the University of Kentucky that actually allows you to synchronize a transcript with the video for oral history so that you can, as you see here, go to specific points in the interview and just see the transcript or listen to that particular point at the interview. So again, they're going to look great once they get online, which hopefully, again, will be soon. And uh, as Stacy also mentioned, many of the interviews uh, grew out of social media comments and out of content donations to the collection. So people that donated material also used that form that I showed you earlier and said, also, would you talk to me about doing an oral history? And we did. So um, here you go. So I'm going to go, go actually to the live site now. Um, here we are. And um, as you see, uh, when you come into the site, uh, we're, it's basically af uh, alphabetical order for the file names. But uh, looking over at the top, we've got sort of this paragraph here, which gives sort of a contextual statement about the full contact, uh, the full uh, collection. I can say this word. Um, over on the right, though, you see also people have uh, very prominently the option to contribute additional materials. This links out to the uh, form for submission and uh, also links to the project team. So um, let's just go in on, uh, this is one of the initial photos. I think that, oops, there's a problem with that one. There's a problem with that whole chunk right now, or else I've got a problem with my browser right now. Um, but um, it's okay, we'll go here. One of the photos uh, actually from Washington, we'll get more local again in just a couple of minutes. As you can see, it's fairly thin metadata. Um, we do have subject headings, we do have topics, topic tags, places, copyright information, um, the photographer. Okay, I'm the photographer on this one, but the photographers are actually identified here. Um, let's go into something a little more local. Durham is a little closer to local. Um, again, you can see here in the uh, description, we actually have attribution of the artist for the photo. We were actually able to find a website from a church in Durham who had worked with a lot of the art, a lot of the artists, and that actually plugged us into information as to who the artists were on a lot of the Durham photos we had. And again, yeah, there's more metadata. Metadata all kind of looks the same, so I'm not going to elaborate on that all that much. Raleigh, Greensboro. So again, um, let me go back in to here, um, we do also have, again, a lot of video, but it's not online right at the moment. So uh, we are working on that. But uh, that's, you know, kind of a general look at the collection. Um, I'll put it in grid view so you can actually get a little more view of photographs, etc. And I, you know, I uh, encourage you to look around at the collection. It's interesting and it's growing, hopefully again, with more interviews and video that will be added shortly. So. Um, that's sort of all I really had as far as a tour of the collection. So, um, I'm all right. Uh, Does anyone have any questions? We have a question um, from Larry asking Have you all thought about redacting protester photos? And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we thought about that, we had to think about that in the initial meeting um, because of all of the news coverage of, of law enforcement using the photos. It turns out we didn't have to do that because the Greensboro response was not a, a violent response or a destructive response. Uh, but we did have to be prepared if, if a um, person contributed a photograph that you could see someone um, you know, throwing a brick through a window that we needed to pay attention to that and be able to um, mark, all, mark, you know, clear, uh, clear their face of identifying factors as well as any 
anything like tattoos, anything that would be noticeable like that. So we that was in our mind. Um, we did ask for if anyone had any questions um, uh, when, when people were signing up and there was someone wondering, um, are there practical ways a public law library could, could contribute to support a community movement like this? Uh, and my immediately thought in, in speaking to people who have worked with civil rights in the past is a law library is in a perfect position to be able to create a easily accessible resource for a protester who is going to potentially find themselves in a situation where they need to know their rights in relation to law enforcement during a protest, um, know about the bail system if, if they uh, for some reason are arrested, um, advice on how to go about find, you know, are there lawyers that specialize in this in the area? I know that you wouldn't be able to make recommendations, but there might be a directory you could link to. So aggregating resources, uh, credible resources um, re in relation to um, legal issues that a demonstrator may face um, during the course of a protest such as this, I think would be an ideal um, way a public law library could contribute. We also have another question that was submitted in advance um, that I'm hoping to ask you both. Um, what was your best kind of marketing and outreach strategy for this collection? Um, I think I think the social media aspect of it was um, because it's highly visual and the material we were collecting was highly visual. So um, we were able to uh, push it out on Facebook, Twitter, and in, uh, Instagram, and Tumblr. Um, of course, different ages use different social media platforms. The protest, the people who were participating in the protest by and far were younger people. They were people in their late teens, early 20s. So a lot of those people are going to be on Instagram or potentially Twitter. Facebook is, is for us older people. Um, so we knew if we were going to reach out to people who were most involved, we needed to go through the channels that they were receiving their news on um, that would be easily shareable. And that may not be in a newspaper, you know, advertising in a newspaper, advertising in a magazine. So um, we found social media to be really our best promotion and outreach strategy. We have another question from Teresa asking, do you include written profiles of artists and other people who are in the collection? So um, we do have uh, oral histories with some of the artists that will give you know personal information and there's transcripts relating to those. Um, and if we are given the information, we can include it in the metadata. The issue we have is we have a lot of photographs of the art that do not have any identification relate on them. So we haven't been able to track down the artists themselves. Um, one thing that I don't know if we were very clear about, we have two collecting situations where one collecting situ situation is a pure donation where someone is literally signing over the material, whether that's physical or digital. Then we have the situation where a community member can sign a license to allow us to digitally display their creative material. Most of the material in the collection is not actually fully donated. It's a community member allowing us to put that material in. For the, and for that reason, because they could do this anonymously, we don't necessarily have the information. Um, for the people who did donate, because I would be actually talking to them to get context and information, the finding aid for their collection, um, because it's also going to be processed as any other archival collection, is going to include a biographic note and scope of um, 
and description of the of the material as it relates to the person to the creator. So I guess the best way to say is sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. The ideal is that we do, but we don't always have the information to be able to do that. <laughs> Sorry, I just muted myself instead of unmuting myself. I think uh, the situation that we have right now, now that we have a little distance from the big push of the collection is when we can go back and sort of assess where we want to flesh out some of this metadata and description. And ideally, in my world, throw it open to classes that might do kind of more interpretive exhibits related to it. Um, because, you know, I'm really in favor of that, actually. Um, that was actually, um, David, sorry to cut you off, but that was actually a question that was just private message to me um, <laughs> just a minute ago is, um, have you both thought about kind of what sort of library class instruction that the collection could be used for? Sure. So uh, we all, Dr. Tara Green actually teaches a Black Lives Matter class. Um, so that was what was happening while all this was happening. So uh, uh, obviously African-American and diaspora studies, there's going to be a huge collection if, if they're studying modern movements. We have also seen use with our, um, art, our art program. Um, we have people in the Honors College reading, reaching out to us. Um, the history department can also reach out to us. We could use, I have used this material for general primary source instruction because the idea of a mural or a picture of a mural as a primary source is a great way to be able to teach students about primary sources being more than just documents and recordings. So uh, to, to give you an idea, we teach on, in non-COVID times, we would teach over 150 classes a semester. Uh, you know, not me personally, but across our department, our special collections and archives department. So this is a, a collection that is highly incorporated throughout a broad range of, of classes in different departments. And we are having professors who are actively interested in us talking to their students about this. We actually also work a lot with our LIS department. So hopefully we're indoctrinating the next generation of librarians to be interested in doing things like this too. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's a great point. I do see a question in chat uh, asking if we got any pushback from people in our library regarding the collecting the material and the answer to that is absolutely not. Everyone was incredibly excited. They were a little bit concerned when, uh, so for example, I was following the Chauvin trial because I assumed if the verdict was not what it was, we would be seeing more protests, which we would have to document and, and put do another push out for. So um, like much of the nation for various reasons, we were watching that. Uh, the only push, the closest pushback I got was personal concern if I was going to go out to protests that might turn violent or nasty if I went out um, and, and personally tried to document them. Um, so there was no pushback whatsoever about the, the topic. Um, we have a history of, of documenting underrepresented communities, um, including um, the LGBTQ community in this area. We actually, by our reference just, desk, just installed an exhibit on gay bars in Greensboro. <laughs> So our library, I'm, we are exceptionally fortunate that we work in an organization that embraces these sorts of discussions and allows us um, and understands that collecting history is collecting a wide variety of histories of a wide variety of people. I, I would add too that surprisingly little community pushback too. We haven't really had a lot of, we've had, you know, the odd social media troll here and there, but not really a lot of pushback from uh, from the public either, which is refreshing. Yeah, we, we were expecting much more. Oh, that's so good to hear, Teresa. Yeah. 
absolutely. We uh, we actually got a donation from um, someone who was a trainer for Engage in our area, Femi Chateau, and we got an oral history with her. What's really fabulous about her collection, uh, we haven't digitized yet, be yet because or that portion yet because it's physical. Uh, we have her her planner, her paper planner. I didn't know people used planners anymore, where you can see all of the training and the protests she was attending, as well as uh, t-shirts and masks. Um, so uh, I was I was actually pleasantly surprised. Uh, David and I had the conversation that if we got any nasty emails, uh, since we are state employees, they would be a matter of public record and we would just put them in the collection. <laughs> that was how we were going to handle it. Stacey and David, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, I think it's really helpful to see how you reached out to the community itself and understood, you know, the makeup of your, your community, its interests, and it was all something that was like a cyclical process where it's not you kind of speaking for anybody, but it's like you bringing them in in a way that was... I think one of the most kind of thoughtful uh, ways I've seen an archive do community driven projects. And so um, my hat's off to you. That was really great to see. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And if anyone at their respective institutions uh, would be interested in planning their own project like this, feel free to reach out to David and myself. We would love to see this happening locally and regionally all over North Carolina. And if you're really nice, I'll tell you how to convert HEIF files too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, it is three o'clock. And so um, if you'd like to stick around for the optional breakout rooms, feel free. Um, if not, um, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Um, I am submitting the link to the feedback survey here. Um, Jenna, the breakout rooms won't be recorded. We're just kind of doing an informal conversation, um, but I will stop the recording now for this session. Um,